pray this morning. I'm going to try to get what's in my heart to my head, and then from my head to your head, and then hopefully from your head to your heart this morning. And I hope it will make sense to you this morning. Let's turn to Numbers chapter 21. Numbers chapter number 21. you found Numbers 21, put a finger there and then turn to John chapter number 3. Yes, John chapter number 3. Well, we're going to begin in Numbers 21, verse number 6, in Roman or Numbers 21. Verse number 6, the Bible says this, And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for he has spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. The Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass that every one that is bitten when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole, and it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. Now let's look at verse or uh, John chapter number 3 and verse number 14. We know Christ is speaking to Nicodemus here, and he says this to him in verse number 14. He says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, this morning for everything you've done for us, God. Lord, I thank you for the sweet spirit that we feel in here this morning. And God, I pray we wouldn't take it for granted, Lord, but I pray this morning, Lord, that you just give us exactly what we need out of your word, that you just help us, God, to do exactly what we're supposed to do. And Lord, I pray this morning you would just get out of me what you want, Lord. And God, I know what you've laid on my heart, Lord, and I pray, God, that I can convey it in such a way it just be simple for us to understand this morning. And God, I pray, Lord, especially for somebody here this morning, Lord, that doesn't know you as Savior, God, I pray you'd save them before it's everlasting too late. And God, just give us the help that we need this morning. And we ask us all in your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As you look at Numbers chapter 21, we know a little bit of what's happening just from what we just read is that the Lord sent those fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and it says much of the people died. And then they came to Moses. Wasn't it interesting that whenever everything seemed to be going okay or they didn't have really any troubles, that they began to murmur against Moses, and then they get to the water and stuff, they murmur against Moses, but then they always seem to come back to Moses and say, Moses, we got a problem going on. We need you to fix something. But I want you to notice that God doesn't necessarily take away those serpents out of this passage. Not one place do I find where God says, okay, I'm just going to remove the serpents away from them to where they're not going to be bit anymore. But instead, He gives them an antidote. He gives them something that if they get bitten, that they can be okay, that there's a way for them to continue to live. And He tells Moses, after Moses prays for the people, He says, make thee a fiery serpent and set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten when he looketh upon it shall live. So we know just from knowing what the, if you want to call it a picture application of what serpents are in the Bible, is we know that Satan shows up in Genesis chapter number 3 as a serpent. In Revelation it says that he, uh, he lays hold of that old serpent, Satan, the great dragon, and he does that to him over in Revelation. So we know that a serpent is Satan, or it is also, we can call it a picture of, as we see here, a picture of sin. Now, as we're looking at this, these, these serpents have come out, these fiery serpents. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't want to get bit by any sort of snake at all, let alone as this one, or what the Bible's calling it here, a fiery serpent. And if you've ever watched Steve Irwin, Steve Irwin would jump down there in Australia, the crocodile hunter, and I used to love watching him, but there ain't no way I would do half the stuff that he would do, that he'd watch all these crazy animals or the reptiles and stuff, and you know what he'd do? He'd walk over there to that pit and be like, Crikey, this is the most venomous steak in Australia. I don't know if that's an Australian accent or not, but he would. He'd walk over there, he'd look at those serpents. I mean, that pit would be full of those snakes, and Steve Irwin would just jump right off in there, and 
And he would pick them up and start playing with them and let them wrap around it. And what we never saw was the people behind the scenes. We would watch Steve Irwin, that Steve Irwin was there, but we know that behind the scenes that if he got bit, they had an antidote. They had medicine right there for him if he got bit. But what we know happens with Steve Irwin is he played around with enough stuff that would hurt him that he was swimming in the ocean and all of a sudden that stingray just got him right beside the heart or in the heart and that poison got into him. And what we need to understand this morning is that sin is the same way for us. That as we go out and we continue to play around with it enough and we continue to mess with it enough, Sooner or later, you are going to get bit. You stay around a snake long enough. You stay around something that doesn't like you or something that doesn't care about people. I mean, you watch those people who go out into the Yellowstone National Park and stuff, and they'll go up there, and they'll get beside those buffaloes, or they'll get beside something, and they're all in amazement at these great majestic animals, and they get a little bit too close for comfort, and what happens? Those animals do what those animals are supposed to do, and they attack, they protect, just like with bears and things. But what we need to understand is sin is the same way. We know sin is there. We know that it can hurt us. It's not for us to go up and start taking pictures and to coddle up beside it and think that everything's okay. If y'all remember the story, I told you about that little boy who was sitting there at his or in his living room while his mom, or at the, I guess it was the living room leading outside somewhere, and the mom was in the kitchen. She kept hearing the door open, and then it would close, and then there would be another thud on the door, and that baby would just start cackling, laughing, just having a good time. And finally, after a few times, the mom walked in there wondering what's going on, and to her horror, right outside of that door was a big rattlesnake that was just sitting there. And every time that door would swing open and shut, as soon as it would shut, that snake would strike and that's what many of us are doing is we're playing with the door of sin i mean we're opening it and opening it and opening it and because we don't get bit right then we just think it's a good time we think it's fun we think everything is all right but you leave that door open for just one second too long and that snake strikes and gets a hold of you you're done for it's over you're gonna die and what is happening here in numbers chapter number 21 is there's some serpents that are going around into the camp and we know that the children of israel i mean you find it over in hebrews chapter number 11 whenever it talks about by faith by faith by faith well you know what it says about the children of israel it only says one thing about them by faith they crossed the red sea when pharaoh's army came after them then you don't see anything else about faith about them why we know what they do throughout the wilderness. They don't have hardly any faith at all. It's really a picture of the church today. As we go through, it's a, we're sitting there and we're saying, well, we made it over the Red Sea by faith, but then nothing afterwards. And they were just playing and playing and playing with sin. And we see that God shows the consequences of sin throughout. I mean, opening the earth and swallowing them up. And then we know the consequences of after Moses has struck the rock the second time instead of speaking to the rock. That God just tells Moses, you can see the promised land, but you'll never enter into it. And we see the consequences of sin. But also, what we need to understand this morning is that every single one of us has been bitten. Every single one of us has been bitten. There's not one of us in here this morning that has not been bitten by this snake. Not one of us. I don't care how good you think you are, how good everybody else says you are, how good your parents are, whatever, I, it, none of that matters. The Bible says for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And we'll get into that here in a minute. But every single one of us, we have been bitten. All of us, we've been bitten. But we've also been given an antidote. As we're sitting here, Mo, God's given Moses the antidote. He says, make thee a fiery serpent, put him upon a pole and lift it up. And whoever will look at that serpent, whoever will look up at that snake, they will live. They'll live. Could you imagine being bitten by a snake? And Moses walks over there to you and says, all you got to do is just look up at this serpent and everything will be okay. Everything will be fine. Everything's all right. Could you imagine having that happen if you was out in the middle of the woods? Let's just say, go over here, just walk up in the woods, and you get bitten by a copperhead. Somebody just says, well, look up at that tree and you'll live. Everything will be okay. You'd be like, no, there ain't no way. I need to get to a doctor. And many times that's what the world will do to us. We've been bitten by sin. They're watching us go through the consequences of sin. They're watching families fall apart. They're watching your life fall apart. And they'll tell you everything you need, that you need to go to this, you need to do this, you need to drink this, you need to take that. 
and they try to give us all these other things, and some things are okay that maybe it'll help you out. Maybe it's a gift from God, but if we miss the very first and most important thing, none of those things are going to make your life better. None of those things are the antidote to making your life better. It was looking up at that pole, at that serpent that could save them. And could you imagine that first one that Moses walked up to, and he says, if you just look up at this serpent, you'll live. And he's sitting there saying, Moses, you're crazy. Moses, you don't know what you're talking about, but I'm hurting so bad. I'm struggling bad enough. The venom is now going through my veins, and it's just hurting. I can't hardly get up anymore. You know what? I'm just going to look up at that serpent. I'm just going to do what Moses says because nothing else is working, so I'm going to look up there. Could you imagine as he took that glance up, and all of a sudden his arms started feeling better, the numbness started going away, the pain started going away, and all of a sudden he said, you know what? I feel a lot better. All I had to do was look up and do what they said. All I had to do was have the faith to look up there at what Moses said to look at. And you know what he probably did? He probably ran through that camp saying, hey, guys, if you've been bitten, just look up there and live. Look and live. Look and live. And what Jesus is saying there is he's saying, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must I be lifted up that now as all men pass by, we have to see him high and lifted up, that our eyes have to look. And what he's saying is you can look and live. You can look and live. You see, the world doesn't have the antidote to our sin problem. Jesus does. And only Jesus does. And what we need to understand this morning is it's up to us to go and tell people about it. But I want to preach this this morning just because the Lord laid this heavy on my heart this morning. And I don't know why. I didn't know who was going to be here. didn't know if there was going to be... I didn't know this morning... But the Lord laid this message heavy on my heart. Let's look at the book of Romans. Let's look at the book of Romans. And this morning, I'm just going to preach through the Romans road about looking and living. Just preach through the Romans road because I believe, and I, I, I don't say this just to say it, I believe there's somebody this morning in here that needs to get saved. Whether it's somebody who's been here for 20, 30 years, whether it's somebody who this is only the second or third time they've ever been inside a church, I, I don't know. But I believe this morning somebody needs to get saved. And we would all do good that we would do, as Paul said, to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling this morning, to take a look at ourselves and make sure that we know that we're going to heaven. Because even Jesus told them, he said, many in that day will pro or tell me, they'll say, Lord, Lord, haven't we prophesied in thy name and in thy name done many wonderful works and in thy name cast out... I mean, look at everything that we've done, aren't we saved? The Bible says that your works are, or your righteousness is as filthy rags and many people are doing that. Now, I'm getting ahead of myself, but many people are going to depend on their works thinking that's going to get them into heaven when that is not what gets you into heaven. But this morning, let's look at Romans chapter number 3 and verse number 10. Romans chapter number 3 and verse number 10 and then verse number 23, the Bible says this, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Verse number 23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. First thing that we've got to understand is all means all. There's not one of us in here that is a head and shoulders or levels above anybody else in the aspect or in the eyes of God. Not one of us is better than anybody else. Not one of us can do more than anybody else. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. And churches get that aspect or they get that uh, credibility to where whenever people look at a church or look at people, the very first thing that they think, it's almost like judging a book by its cover. They hear that you're a Christian and automatically you know what their mind goes to is, you're a holier art or a holier than thou type of person. You think you're better than everybody else. You think you're good. You think you're all of this. When the fact of the matter is, if, if you talk to most real Christians who are really saved, they'll tell you, I'm not any better than you. I'm just a sinner saved by grace. Yes, I have higher standards, and I should be living to that higher standard, but I'm no better than who you are. I'm no better than what you are. All I am is a sinner. What we've got to understand is that our body, soul, and spirit is so entangled and entwined together that they're so close together. There's only one thing that the Bible says that can divide it asunder, and you know what that is, is it is the 
Word of God. And what this Word of God does is this is what will get somebody under that conviction to make them realize, man, that man named Jesus, he really did love me. He really did care about me. You've heard about Charles Spurgeon. He was sitting there and he was just testing the acoustics in his new church. And he quoted John 1, 29, Behold the Son of Man, or behold the Lamb of God who cometh to take away the sins of the whole world. And there was a man up in the rafters who was working that Charles Spurgeon didn't even know or that, know that he was in there. And Charles Spurgeon just quoted that one verse. And that man fell under such conviction that he fell down and he got saved. Why? Because the Word of God. There was a preacher out in the woods began to preach. I mean, just preaching the Bible, just preaching out into the middle of nowhere. And if you're not a preacher, you don't understand. I used to preach to stuffed animals whenever I was 17. I'd set them up at the house. I know now y'all, wow, he's so immature. And I, no, I, I would do it because I just like to preach. But this man was out in the woods and he was preaching. And all of a sudden there was some guy just walking through the woods that the preacher didn't know was there. And that man dove down into like a ditch or a hole in the woods and just sat there while that preacher was preaching. And he ended up getting saved. And the thing is we got to understand is that this Word of God, this gives us that power to divide our body, our soul, and our spirit to make us realize that we can be saved. For faith cometh by hearing, but hearing by the Word of God. And what this Bible says, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Verse 23, for all sinned and come short of the glory of God. Whenever somebody begins to tell you that you need to get saved, it's not them saying, hey, look at me, I'm so much better than you. It's them saying, I know where you're going, I know what you're headed to, and I love you enough to tell you that there is a man named Jesus that loved you so much that even while you were a sinner, that even while you were in this situation, that he loved you so much that he looked past your sin, he looked past your unrighteousness and saw you as a son, as somebody that, was, or that he was willing to die for. And that's what Christ was. So many of us will ask, what will you do for me? Well, Christ answered it the ultimate way, and he gave his entire life for you and for me. So first thing we have to understand is every single one of us were unrighteous, and we were sinners. Every single one of us. Not one person in here can look down their nose at anybody else and say, I'm better than you. That's pride. That's pride. That's pride. God says he hates it. So every single one of us, we've got to understand we're unrighteous, we were unrighteous, and we were sinners, saved by grace. So we see that. But then let's look at uh, Romans chapter number 4. Romans chapter number 4. Verse number 5. says this, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Look at chapter number 5 and verse number 20. The Bible says this, Moreover, the law entered, that where the, or that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Then if you go to Hebrew or Ephesians chapter number 2 and verse number 8, For it's not by work, or for by grace are we saved through faith, and that not of works, and that not of ourselves, lest any man should boast. So another thing that we have to understand is we're sinners, we're unrighteous, we were wicked, we were vile in need of a Savior. Next thing we have to understand is you can't do anything about it. There's nothing you can do to do anything about it. Many people, they'll realize that, wait a second, look at me. And many people will justify what they're doing wrong by saying, well, look at everything that I do right. Man, when we look past what I'm doing wrong, look past at that, but look at all this other good that I am doing. I've already quoted the verse that Isaiah said, for our righteousness is as filthy rags in the sight of God that you might be the best person in the world, in the eyes of the world, you're giving to charities, you're doing all of these things. You might be somebody who sat in church on a church pew your entire life, never got out into the world, never took a sip of alcohol, never took any sort of drug, never done any of that sort of stuff, but you were still on your way to hell. And it didn't matter how much you've been in church, it didn't matter the songs you sung, it didn't matter the Bible you carried, it didn't matter how much you gave to the offering, didn't matter how much you served, didn't matter any of that kind of thing, that if you didn't get saved, if you didn't fall under conviction, and by grace are you saved through faith of looking at Christ and saying, look at how wicked and vile that I am, that I can only be saved by one way. It's not by my works, but it's by my faith in Him. And many people, I believe, are right in a church view straight off into hell because they say, I've been in church my whole life. I've done all of these things. I've done it, 
That's counting on your works. That's your works. Do I think you should be in church? Yes. Do I think you should read your Bible? Yes. Do I think you should pray? Yes. Do I think you should give? Yes. Do I think we should do all of those things? Yes. But that's a product of salvation. That's a product of your faith. But faith without works is is dead. But what we need to understand is that there's only one person who can do something about that sin-sick condition that we have, and that's for us to look and live at Him. To look up at Him and realize that that's the only way we can get to heaven. And a big danger that we have, and I'm going to throw this in there, a big danger that the church does, we want to make people scared of hell. We want to get people scared of hell that they don't want to go to hell. Being scared of hell is not what saves you. It's believing in Jesus Christ. And so many times that's what we do is we want to scare people into salvation when the thing is is we need to preach Christ. Yes, hell is a byproduct of not accepting Christ. But what we need to do is show them there's somebody that loved them so much that he gave his life for them so they didn't have to go to that place and believe in Christ, believe in him. And I'll give you another fallacy that I learned that I used to preach, and I'll go ahead, if I preach it here, I'm sorry. And I, when people say that Christ preached more on hell than he did heaven, no, he didn't. Go back and read through the Bibles. I'm not going to count it up. This is a whole, this is a rabbit, and I usually don't shoot rabbits, but I see them hopping this time, and I'm, I'm shooting it. Christ didn't preach more on hell than he did on heaven. Go back through the Gospels and read it and count it yourself. I did it because I heard somebody preach on it. He didn't. He preached more on heaven than he did on hell. We have to get back to the point where we show them that it's trusting in Christ. It's trusting in Him. And that's what we need to be preaching is Christ. Yes, we should preach on hell. Nobody wants to go there. I'm not saying don't preach on hell. Preach on it. Tell people about it. But tell them about Christ and how they can get to heaven. Not scare them of hell. And I believe there's many people who were just scared of hell and that's it. I mean, if somebody came up and told you that there's a place of fire, there's a place of wailing and gnashing of teeth, it's dark, people are bumping up against each other and they're on fire and they're burning for the rest of the... I mean, that sounds scary. I don't want to go there. You don't want to go there. So repeat this one, two, three prayer after me and you won't go there. That's leading a lot of people straight to hell. And we've got to be careful about it. It's by grace through faith. Faith in who? Jesus. So we see that it's only by, or it's only by faith in Him, not of our works. Then let's look at Romans chapter number 6. Romans chapter number 6 and verse number 23. The Bible says this, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I heard something interesting, and I wrote it down on a piece of paper. I wish I would have brought it up here with me. It was the difference in everlasting and eternal. I think it was eternal has a beginning but has no end end, while everlasting has no beginning and no end. I believe that's how it is. If I'm wrong, then I'll flip-flop at the night and I'll tell you. But I believe that's what it is, especially reading it here, is that our eternal life started when? When we accepted Christ as our Savior. It was a gift, a gift from God Himself. Now, I like getting gifts. I don't know anybody that doesn't like getting gifts. People will try to act super spiritual and super humble and say, it's better to give than to receive. No, no, it's not. Don't don't lie to me and say, I'm just kidding. Y'all are all, I said that about pride, and then I said that. We all like receiving gifts. I like giving gifts. I like seeing the joy and stuff. But imagine getting a gift from somebody who knows you better than anybody else, being better than you even know yourself. That's what God did for us. Picture it like this. I'll use Brother Eric as an example, and I'll even use my kids as an example along with him. Because Huntley and Callie are really good friends, so we'll, I'll use them two as an example, all right? Well, I'll use them. Gender roles are going to have to swap here, so don't think that I'm getting liberal or anything. But let's just picture Huntley as a boy and Callie as a boy right here. I didn't think about it before I said it. But we'll, we'll say it like this. We'll just say a child. Eric has Callie and I have Huntley. So let's just say that uh, Huntley and Callie got to be really good friends but they only got to meet each other one time, and they got so close that they wrote it down on a calendar saying, next year, this week is when they're going to come back. Next year, this week is when they're going to get to see each other again. So Eric and Callie, they leave, and Callie looks at Eric and says, you know what, Dad, I want to build a gift for Huntley. 
I mean, I don't want you to pay for it at all. I want to do it all by myself. I want to work for it. I want to do everything for it. I mean, I want to build the gift that I want to build for her, and I don't want any help with it. I'm just going to do it myself. And for that next year, Eric watches as instead of Callie going out and being with her friends, instead of Callie and doing all these other things that she would normally like to do, Callie stays in and she works and she earns the money to put towards the gift. And, I mean, you watch blood, sweat, and tears get put into this gift all the way up for an entire year. And then the week before, Eric looks at her and says, you know what? We're getting ready to go back. You're going to get to see Huntley again. Is your gift ready? And she says, yeah, I've just got to paint it. I've just got a few extra touches just to put onto it, and then everything will be good to go. So they load it up. They go, and they pull it up to the Huntley's house, and uh, Eric drops it off, puts it up at the front door, and leaves Callie there and backs down the street a little bit and watches as Callie goes and knocks on her door with no answer. Knocks on it again. No answer. And Callie looks back at Eric and says, what do I do? And at that point, Eric sees, and if you've ever been visiting, or if you go visiting enough, you'll see it happen. The blinds kind of shift a little bit, so you know somebody's in there, but they're not necessarily wanting to answer the door. But Eric says, knock on her door again. So he knocks on her door again. Huntley swings the door open, says, what do you want? Why are you here? And Callie looks and says, well, for this entire year, I've been building this gift. I mean, look at all the work that I put into it. I, I just knew you'd love it. And Huntley says, I don't want that gift. Get out of here and slams the door in Callie's face. You know what that happens is it broke the heart of the child, but you know what that did to the father? It invoked the wrath of the father. That now the father's upset, the father's mad that they didn't accept that gift. People ask, why would a loving God send people to hell by rejecting the gift that he watched his son bleed and die for, knowing that he had done nothing wrong, knowing that for three or for the 33 and a half years that he lived, that the world despised him, that the world rejected him, that he was beaten beyond recognition for us as a gift, for us to look at him and say, I don't want it, I don't want any part of it, and to just slam the door in his face because that's what he says to the layout to see in churches. For behold, I stand at the door and I'm, I'm knocking. And any man that will answer, I will come in with him, and I will sit with him, and I will sup with him. And that's what Christ is doing this morning, is knocking on our heart's door. But many people are slamming that door in his face and saying, I don't want any part of it. I want nothing. And then we wonder why a loving God would send somebody to hell. That's why is rejecting his son. That gift is free for the taking. You don't have to do anything to get it. He loved you so much that he did everything for it that all we have to realize is that I'm unworthy, I'm a sinner in need of salvation, that everything that I can do, it won't amount to anything. But if I accept His Son and believe in His Son, that I get this gift of salvation, that I get this free gift, what better thing could you ask for than to spend eternity with somebody that loved you so much that He would give His life for you? But the alternative to it is that. I like what one person said, if you're born again, if you're saved, you were born twice and you only die once. But if you're lost, you're born once, but you die twice. And we have to understand that rejecting that gift is signing our ticket straight into the lake of fire by rejecting his gift. And I believe with all my heart that if you continue to reject, you continue to say no, that there's going to come a point in time where you're going to cross a line and God's going to stop dealing with you. And you just keep putting it off and you keep saying no. You're flirting with that line and that's a dangerous place to be. Especially after hearing a message this morning that is telling you exactly, taking you down the road, showing you that you're a sinner, showing you that you're in need of salvation, showing you it's not your work, showing you that it is a free gift for you to accept. You have no excuses. There's no excuse. There's going to be nobody with an excuse when they stand before God that day that they'll look and they'll try to come up with it. And you know what Christ will say? Depart from me, ye that work iniquity, for I never knew you. But there is a good side to it, and it's that gift. Romans 5, 8, But God committeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The worst condition that you've ever been in, I mean, somebody who knows the worst about you. All the skeletons that you have in your closet, he knows about. 
but he loves you the most. What a God that he knows the very worst thing about you, and he still loves you anyway. If we were to write all our sins across the church, we would look at each other and be, we'd be ashamed. I mean, we'd be ashamed of one another but of ourselves if people knew our sin. Christ still loves you. Christ knew it when he died for it. Christ already knew and loved you that much that while you were yet a sinner. So what do you have to do? Romans 10 makes it clear. Romans 10, verse number 9 and 10. This is what Paul tells them here. Romans 10, verse number 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, Thou shalt be saved, for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with mouth confession is made unto salvation. And then I like what he says in verse number 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. For whosoever. That's a gift that's good for anybody. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. See, we've all been bitten by that serpent. Every single one of us has been bitten by that serpent. But this morning, you know what Christ is calling out? is the same thing Moses called out. Look and live. Look and live. Look and live. Realize who you are. Realize what you are. And realize that there's somebody up in heaven that can do something about it. This morning, I believe with all my heart, maybe there's just somebody in our lives that we know needs to get saved. Maybe it's just somebody in our mind right now that we know needs to get saved, that the Lord's just showing us we need to pray for them. We need to tell them, look and live. We need to show them. But maybe this morning it's you that you know that if you died this morning that you're lost and on your way to hell. Maybe that's you this morning. And the thing is, is your pride is already beginning to speak to you. If you're lost, your pride is already beginning to speak, saying, you can't go get saved. What is everybody going to think about you? What is everybody going to say? They're just going to make fun of me. They're just going to say this. That is nothing more than Satan just lying into your ear, telling you worry about all this stuff. That's nothing more than Satan just telling you, and that will lead you straight to hell. I believe there's two things that will lead most people to hell. It's pride and procrastination. That Satan will whisper in your ear and say, you've got plenty of time. You're only 19. You're only 20. You're only 35. You're only 72. You're, I mean, Satan's looking and saying, you've got plenty of time. You know what the Bible says? For now is the day of salvation. Now is the day. Not tomorrow, not this evening, not of next week, next Sunday. He's saying for now is the day of salvation. None of us is promised tomorrow. The only promise that we have is now, right now. And I believe with all my heart that if you would just get up and accept Christ, there's rejoicing in here. The Bible says there's rejoicing in the presence of angels. There ought to be people standing up being glad that you came and got saved. They're not going to be upset. They're not going to look down on you and be like, wow, I can't believe that that person wasn't saved. If they're like that, they're nothing better than the prodigal son's brother whenever he came back home and said, well, look at this, look at all this. Don't worry about them. Your pride and that procrastination is not worth going to hell over. It's just not worth going to hell over. I'd rather go ahead and get it settled and nailed down today than to keep putting it off and then one day we're gone or one day we die and we stand before God and he says, depart from me, ye that work iniquity, for I never knew you. You won't be able to say, well, I was there on November 13th and I heard the preacher preach and I heard what he said. I carried my Bible. I read. I I did all this stuff. But he'll still say, depart from me, ye that work iniquity, for I never knew you. As we stand this morning, heads bowed and eyes closed, nobody looking around.